So welcome, and today I have the pleasure to have uh, uh, Robert Carrington with me uh, for a conversation that will be partly focused on uh, your ideas about um, what you call aesthetic naturalism. And I am going to pretend that I don't know much about it, which is um, partly true, in fact, but um, uh, I find it um, extremely intriguing for someone who doesn't, uh, who has not heard about it. There's a claim that sounds very familiar. Uh, and that is that you write uh, that nature is all that there is, and there is nothing uh, divine or otherwise that is beyond nature. And that, uh, for someone who read a little bit of philosophy, sounds familiar because we immediately think about Spinoza. Mm -hmm. My first question would be, how, do, how does your approach differ or is similar to uh, Spinoza's one? Mm -hmm. I can understand equating God and nature in his sense. Uh, but if you do that and make them equivalent, you don't need both terms. The difference I have with Spinoza is that I'm very much concentrated on the churning depths of the unconscious of nature as filled with potencies and powers and as the seedbed for archetypes which govern and shape the human psyche and nature itself. So I'm adding Jungian psychoanalysis to Spinoza's bare bones pantheism. And so I call my perspective deep pantheism, which means that you still have some dualities, but they're overcome when the human process reaches the state of creativity, which you would find very congenial, I think, from your perspective. So nature naturing which Spinoza talks about and Aquinas talked about and my mentor Justice Buckler talked about is I wouldn't call it divine I'd call it a perennial creation of nature out of itself alone so there's no one creative act it's continuous and I think the big bang theory whatever its future may be can fit into that it is a creative moment. Nature natured is the indefinitely explorable orders of the world. What Schopenhauer might call the phenomenal piggybacking of Kant. And ecstatic naturalism is concerned with the eruptions of the unconscious of nature through the collective unconscious and the cultural unconscious and the personal unconscious into nature nature and these can crest in what i call sacred folds where you have this tremendous pressure and semiotic density power and meaning come together as paul tillich would put it and this produces what is traditionally called epiphanies. And these epiphanies are best dealt with in the aesthetic realm because all of my work, and I'm sure your work, is committed to nonviolence where possible. And you know, there are cases where it's not possible, of course. And I think the aesthetic sphere is freer from the rigidities and the, mo the emotional armoring and uh, the shells were embedded in that you find in the religious sphere. So Spinoza, for whom I have the greatest respect as a th courageous thinker, didn't quite grasp what psychoanalysis figured out early on through Freud and then Jung and Rank and Reich, Pusteva, Kohat, that 
were sitting on churning potencies about which we often know very little. So they drive us. So then the question of freedom for me tilts heavily toward determinism. However, if you're riding on the back of a sacred fold and it's penetrating you through your transference relationship to it, then you can burst forth with a, a modicum or more of creative energy to shape the self in process. So that those are some of the things I find lacking in Spinoza, but I prefer him to Leibniz, for example, who I see as a science fiction writer. So there you go. <laughs> we'll come back to Leibniz. Um whom I am uh, really discovering lately or rediscovering. Uh, when I was listening to you, I, I mean, of course, it, it ring many bells. Uh, the sacred folds um, seem to uh, echo uh, what Carl Jaspers called uh, ciphers. But yes. before we yes. talk about that, uh, I was also hearing an echo of Plato's Republic, when uh, Socrates says, we want the, the, the guardians, the rulers of the city to be both brave and wise. And he says, well, that's going to be very rare. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, because this is almost like a, a dialectic uh, tension, mm -hmm. uh, which seems to be a little bit the tension that you seem to point, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, between mm. uh, the, the two faces of nature, the two yeah, uh, yeah. aspects of... Um, mm. So, and you, talk, you did talk about violence, right? Yeah. It's very interesting because, I mean, as, as, as humans, and this is also a conversation about philosophical health, so, so being in the world and in 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 uh, mundanity and yet having aspirations towards knowledge and and some form of theosis will i think we we would like to speak about that too a bit later but we need constantly to negotiate right between this sort of uh mm -hmm. impulses that are ambiguous they are both manifesting a a, a energy that is creative but at the same time something that can be perceived as violent mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so what, think, what is, mm, go ahead. yeah no i mean please um i think what happens what i push for is if you're going to deal with strong men strong women social leaders you have to embed yourself in psychopathology because they're often wrestling with forces in their unconscious and in the cultural unconscious, which feeds into them, kind of a zeitgeist phenomenon, if you believe in that. And you can't understand what a politician or a religious leader, what have you, is doing unless you know their personal complexes, that is neurotic disorders or exaggerations or projections, a lot of projection going on in American politics right now, uh, which leads to pretty much nothing of value. So violence is dealt with through the psyche because we all are addicted as human beings to some forms of violence, even verbal violence. It's not eliminatable as far as I can tell but it is shapeable. And here we go back all the way back to Freud with civilization and its discontents that you sublimate. That is you transform uh, an aggressive impulse into a creative act. And we can't be citizens in a hoped for democracy if we don't know psychopathology and of course civics, which they don't teach much anymore here right yeah okay so rewinding a bit um because 
when I hear psychopathology, I hear again using a a platonic. I don't know why I'm so platonic today. Probably because I'm also rereading the Republic, but the um, correspondence between the microcosm, which can be represented by a a one human being and a microcosm and you were talking about the unconscious of nature so what is that unconscious is it simply the uh the the creating the ongoing creation mm -hmm. or is it something uh that is only one aspect of that dynamic yeah good good question I think it's an aspect that is that creative fecundity. You can't have creative fecundity coming out of nature naturing without an equally strong account of entropy, the eating away of order and heat, so to speak, metaphorical heat. And when the unconscious is in motion, which it always is, but when it's especially active, for whatever reasons science could figure out perhaps, then it's going to distort and shape what's in the conscious world or even general consciousness, Kant's uh, or Jasper's Bewusstsein uh, überhaupt, uh, consciousness in general. Even that can be manipulated, something Kant didn't get. Kant did not do understand the shadow in Jung's sense, that is this deep un, uh, subterranean movement that produces uh, actions and thoughts that are really undesirable for the person and the species. Nature naturing is not good, it's not evil, it's prior to that distinction. It doesn't make sense to apply those predicates to natura naturans. The Plato part is very interesting. I haven't thought about that, but I admire Plato mostly through Plotinus. Plotinus is extremely important because he had those mystical experiences of the one, and that dictates his worldview. If you haven't had that experience, you can't really get inside Plotinus the way you can. Right. Uh, yeah okay so that's good so via a plotinus we're we're getting to the one and and i was sort yeah. of um waiting for that moment because so we we've been very briefly um discussing uh prior to this recording that we have similar views um under different names so mm. what i Call creolectics and the cosmology of the creel uh, supposes that there is um, at the core of the universe is this dynamic between the multiple and the one. Mm -hmm. It is actually two aspects of the same. Mm -hmm. And and uh, but you can see that it's not really a dialectic because a, the multiple and the one are. Uh, epistemologically and ontologically different in the sense that the multiple is indistinguishable from a, a sort of a proto matter the matrix mm -hmm. right? if we use another platonic yes, yes while the one is is the logical aspect of it right it's the fact that well if you have a pure multiplicity pure difference it doesn't admit uh an exterior therefore it's a whole therefore there is a sh the shadow of the multiple is the one mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and perhaps we could say vice versa I, I, i'm not mm -hmm. sure that i would say i like that yeah, yeah. so what what would you say actually it, it, should we say that in fact there are two shadows in in dynamic uh you know vibrancy that generate uh, uh the these unequilibriums or disequilibriums therefore uh therefore uh phenomena mm. so a shadow at the bottom which would be the matrix of things 
maybe the great mother archetype you could put in and the mm -hmm. shadow at the top so to speak because right. you can't spatialize this stuff with right. the one. Mm. that's very interesting that would that would require some pretty careful reflection and experience to do that now a dialectic if you're not hegel doesn't have to go anywhere because mm. i believe in cycles not any linear history it doesn't seem to change much it just reiterates and reiterates and reiterates which is why i'm a little friendly to reincarnation as a theory in spite of the social injustices that theory has produced in india and elsewhere hmm. so dialectic i i think determinate negation is in there in hegel's sense hmm. but i don't think there's a or an Determinate negation within the shape of consciousness. This Gestalt and they self bewusst sign. The shapes of self consciousness. The dialectic can almost be like a fractal. It can branch in different ways. It's not boom, flip, elevate. Mm. It's 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 radiating out and, and doing all kinds of things which may not be mappable by us. Mm. That is a mental structure of the one and the matrix and what's in between the between zone which is where we live and we don't often get to the great mother rate matrix or to the the one now the word one may not be the best word for that right. it could be nothingness void well that's interesting because i i i don't like the term uh nothing nothingness and boy i have very um, i have many friends who, who who take it seriously and and we know the history of philosophy uh both western and eastern right with uh buddhist vacuity and uh i prefer as you know to call it creel so the real with a c which i mm -hmm. think La i mean if lacan I, I think lacan would have gotten it more right if, if he had called it creel than rather than real just mm. for a uh, history of science and history of knowledge purposes uh, it's very delicate to 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 call something real out of the um the, mm. the physical list uh, i mean the, the the scientist discourse but mm -hmm. therefore if we call it if we call it a creel this this um sort of um multiple one uh Janus face mm -hmm. then we we might be tempted and the reason I mentioned that is that you you write that you have you were writing or you've already written a book called Mind Travai which is an attempt to unite Darwin with Hindu, Hindu metaphysics mm -hmm. and I have been thinking rather superficially yet about the correspondence between what I'm calling creolectics and and actually taking Darwin's ontology more seriously. So mm -hmm. is, it, is it what you're doing in, in yeah. that book? Yeah. It's combining Darwin with the Upanishads or the, from the Advaita Vedanta non-dual perspective. And I like Swami Nikhilananda's translation of the Upanishads, which has Shankar's commentary in there as well. Combining those two has proven to be extremely difficult. I keep pushing on this project of mind's travail, but then I have to be pushed back because of the difficulties of those issues. How do you get finite, emergent, instrumental, adaptability, adapting consciousness with a sense that Satchitananda, that you have being consciousness and bliss at some point in the human process. Now I call that involution, which is not meant to contradict Darwin, which would be a fool's journey. <laughs> and involution is where the mind is grasped by Hmm, Brahman or nature naturing and it's very tricky terrain for me Jaspers is a midpoint for me right and I served as president of the Carl Jaspers Society of North America for a couple of years and I really admire him I had been a, a Heidegger guy in my youth 
Right. And then the demons came out about him. I said, oh, okay. I gave, I actually gave my Heidegger books away to a graduate student. I had mm. enough. I can uh, understand that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Jaspers was a, a moral person, a good person, mm. and just decent on all counts that I know of. Mm. And what he talks about is this evolution from the empirical to consciousness as such, or consciousness in general is the earlier translation, to spirit to the encompassing mm. or transcendence, he sometimes puts in there. And that consciousness in general is our attempts through logic, reason, experience, and tradition to elevate our perspectives beyond projection, rage, manic bliss, and all these other things we're prey to, to get a sense, perhaps for Kant logically and, and jurisprudently, <laughs> to get a universal out of this that all human beings can affirm. Now, the problem is that has to be very thin as to what general consciousness is. It can't have a lot of boisterous content clashing. Mm. And then, so we can do that. We do that on a rare occasion. And then the Hindu perspective, and there are so many of them, but Advaita Vedanta shows you that whatever the self is, it's immersed in both general consciousness and something beyond, because the spatial terms screw up philosophy badly. <laughs> But mm -hmm. we need them, uh, which would be um, the pulsations and the bliss of Brahman or the divine. Uh, you could use the word God, but that word is so embedded in violence, the word God. It's a weapon word. Right. But I mean, you, since the beginning, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this text from uh, Lacan called... Um, Kant with Sade, the Marquis de Sade, uh -huh. uh, who who wrote famously, uh, uh, you know, uh, Francais encore un effort pour être révolutionnaire, uh, that the French revolutionaries uh, uh, in the 18th century were not really radical, because if they were radical, they wouldn't understand that nature is, as you were saying, pre-moral, a moral. Mm -hmm. And and therefore that it is it includes what would uh, be perceived from a local perspective as cruelty, right? Yeah. Know that that's a that's a perspective. I mean, I'm not here advocating in any way uh, cruelty. Uh, I, I would I, I think kindness is underestimated. But uh, now, if we map in the the unconscious and Darwin in there, and even the self, which we could say, well, the, the self is 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 produced by the the oneness polarity of, of the universe, and so mm -hmm. we have this creel multiplicity that is infinitely dense, energetical, powerful in longing for manifestation, mm -hmm. uh, such that. And, and with the shadow of, of the one, right, which is its, its inner duality, it's constantly branching just to limit its own power. So you have this branching, which for me, it's very much the branching of, of uh, evolutionary uh, mm -hmm. Darwinism, right? But seen, seen from another perspective, seen as a, a, a sort of a self limitation uh of of overabundance mm -hmm. exactly but, and and so if you transpose that in in the microcosm of the individual isn't it what we need to do constantly right we have this um if we use the psychoanalytic language right this uh, immature uh, uh desire for for totality for for mm -hmm. grasping uh um quite randomly and chaotically whatever we can grasp and then thankfully we can 
incorporate a, 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 um, a faithfulness to some oneness, which mm. can be called purpose, which can be called the self, which can be called a value. And this is what philosophical health is saying uh, via the creolectic uh, uh, methodology. So if you have a creel, then if you want to be able to sort of, you, you have this metaphor in your book of riding the horse. Uh, mm -hmm. of, uh, so you, you want to be able to do some, both a logos and an ectos, like, uh, you know, a curating of the manifestation. Mm -hmm such that you give it some order ideally an order that is going to be still alive so let's call it a sacred mm -hmm. uh fold or sacred sacred world a micro world and and i think that's you're right that that's what jaspers is saying but that's i think what a lot of that's what jung is saying in a way, that's what also uh, Freud is saying, perhaps less um, uh, excitingly or less creatively, with more uh, sort of moralism in him. Yeah. So it sounds to me, and and again, I'm I'm saying this a bit confusingly, but it sounds to me that there is a unity behind all these discourses. Mm -hmm. There is. Um, I think. You, you need depth psychology, but also object relations psychology in terms of the fee phenomenal field you're embedded in and how that works. But Jung used to argue that individuation is a task. It's a travail, I would say. And it's you're wrestling with powers greater than yourself, and you often don't know that. And so shaping that into a I would call it a living gestalt, is a morally strenuous activity because we are pulled by the objects or the orders in nature natured in so many ways right. that shaping the self is very difficult. Right. And we have the problem, certainly in, our, in America, of extreme narcissism. We're a very narcissistic culture. <laughs> And I think it's not, not global. I think I think we are all Americans on that matter. Yes, yeah. So uh, that narcissism, I I like your word that it's trying to create a false totality around the imperial self. And here I like Yasper's notion of shipwreck or foundering, where that bloated shell of self worship can crack maybe through another human being getting inside of you and helping you see what, how messed up your narcissism is. Mm. Yeah. So it's the quest for totality. Well, I'm thinking of Levinas here too. Mm -hmm. is, right. uh, has this real dangers. Right. But this is so interesting. I, I, I need to interrupt you because otherwise um, there's so much uh, there to unfold and um, I won't be able to grasp and I'm not able to grasp all the fruits, but I see two here. Uh, we're going to leave the second for later. It's, it's, I want to speak about the person through Le Levinas. The first one is that you talked about the travail of, let's say, of, of, uh, of self-curation or, or self-edification. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you use the term moral. But you previously talked about creation and, and the artist. And... There's another French word, which is oeuvre. Why not talk about oeuvre rather than uh, mm -hmm. travail? Mm -hmm. It's more Nietzschean, right? I would say. Yeah, but. yeah. right. So the, you're creating a structure, an emotional field, a framework within which these pulsations from below again a spatial term are uh, shaped and contained and that's the hardest human task because impulses rule the world mm -hmm. and those impulses 
are kind of like a bad infinite. They just keep going. Mm-hmm. And they don't go anywhere. And anywhere important except maybe leads toward misery. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, right. Right. So the artist, in a way, has, has always proposed a model for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and God knows artists are, have impulses and actually need impulses. So I tend to say that they are throwing uh, each work of art is a, a message in a bottle, like in the, in, in the song. And they say they send SOS. But SOS has a, a, an acronym for system, over and style. Mm. So through through the ideal of style, which can be very painful to attain, Mm -hmm. uh, the artist is sort of um, creating an analogy, I believe, with with what a philosophically healthy person might try to do is sort Mm -hmm. sort of have some sort of coherence, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and that style can only manifest in a nerve. So. That sort of the functions, I would say, as a protection against narcissism, because you need to show in the world that mm-hmm. unity. You can just not fant- you, you, you yeah. fantasize it, right? Yeah, yeah. And and ideally, that um, idea, ideal, ideally and dangerously, that might lead at least in the horizon to a system. And by that, I mean that it can, and that's perhaps the limit of art, at least bad art, is that at one point you need to start theorizing. You need to start transposing the aesthetic into the the epistemological, right? So Mm -hmm. SOS uh, that we are, I mean, when we're healthy, we're constantly sending the SOS to the others and to ourselves, right? Yes, message in That's the what philosophical health is trying to do to sort of in dialogue, like we're doing today. Yeah. Um, give some, some appearance of shape or, or, or point to some co-creation of worlds. And I'll finish on that, uh, this in, this moment, this intervention, by saying that I think that philosophy, since Plato, uh, with sometimes bad answers. I mean, the Republic at some moments it it sounds like it sounds worse than than uh, Stalin and Hitler put together. But yeah. Yeah. nevertheless, it philosophy is this almost mutation of the mind that says, wait a minute, we can have paradise on Earth not in the afterlife and and let's build it together as a world Hmm. well philosophy is very hard to do because it goes against all of our impulses which can be narcissistic thinking generically is a struggle but i think and you would strongly agree with this, philosophy has a great healing function. And I have this weird theory that a lot of philosophers don't do psychoanalysis because they want a cleaner universe where they don't have to pay attention to what's going on below. Mm -hmm. So it's like a chess game for some, whereas it should be modeling for others and yourself and your family and whatnot of what a transfigured person will look like who adds novel creative products to the cultural world. Even if it's uh, in action and not writing, you can do it through dance, painting, and so on, music. Um, but it's it's attempt to heal yourself, which is the hard part, and then make that as a template or model for all of us. Hmm. That's a kind of ambition, but here I think Socrates trumps Plato. It's whatever we know, Socrates is through Plato, but uh, right. Socrates is not building an empire. Right, Plato was. I I think there is a a truth in what you just said, which could be rephrased uh, in in the following manner: is that it's already healing 
to start speculating without uh, having all the answers, which we, is what yeah. Socrates is about, right? It and really because it's, it's when you enter that and when you practice that, it's it's like a natural drug, I think. And it, it actually, I think we can show probably, and and I think there's um, there is quite a lot of emerging quantitative signs about um, the effects of uh, purpose in life. Mm -hmm. And I think just the fact of thinking about universals and manipulating concepts in your mind, it's probably um, for the for the chemistry of the brain, although I don't like to do this kind of uh, explanations. Mm. But so, so and indeed, so Plato, uh, being more systematic and propositional uh, sometimes uh, fails to um, acknowledge that it is, it is enough to be on the way towards knowledge mm -hmm. uh, uh, rather than to be already there, right? I often, that's why I prefer to use uh, the term sense-making when I speak of philosophical health rather than meaning making because we want to avoid fetishizing meaning mm -hmm. uh, which is all sometimes been made in, yeah uh, that's right yeah. philosophy right and so which leads us to the second point that i left um in the air a few minutes ago which is uh the person so this is interesting because i think that's what you, you spoke about levinas and and the face i think the face of the other in front of you, I think that represents his person would or her person would, and that being a term that cannot never be pinpointed, defined very clearly. It's it's a blurry space, mm -hmm. which leads me to a provocative question. I don't uh, probably not provocative for you, but for our listeners in in our times, and that since you're Jungian, part or at least partly, and since we're talking about personhood, it seems to me unavoidable to speak about the difference between women and men here. You see what yeah. I'm getting at? Mm -hmm. So they seem to be more attentive to the personhood in the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could be a cultural training. It doesn't matter. While, while men seem to be more focused to towards the function mm -hmm. of, of the entity in front of you um, mm -hmm. and therefore if you are a functionalist you might actually sometimes consider some humans at the same level than this glass for example yes it happens in warfare hmm. well I think one of the interesting questions is with gender is the role of empathy. And Schopenhauer saw empathy um, as a, a phase transition. It's an ontological event, empathy. It's not, oh, I see your head or I see your heart or feel it. It's more a process of stripping away the shells between individuals so that there's a not fusion in the borderline personality sense, but a, a deep connection that's that has being to use that ultra slippery word. And if women are more empathic, that can be an extremely important moment in social political life that we're not getting. Now, I don't want to speculate about male energy, female energy. That's endlessly complex and lots of uh, different positions on it. But I think, I just look at my childhood, male energy was always competitive to create, to challenge, to beat out people and to be the best. And that can produce a lot of misery for a lot of people. If that's what you do. Right. Uh, Which can be found today both in men and women, by the way. The uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And I think Freud's right that we have uh, creative energies, but there is a death drive. It's, it's not instinct in German. Mm -hmm. 
It's a drive. And yeah. when I look at war, and when I look at human beings, self-destructive powers, which are amazing, I think there is something like a death drive. I, I was very resistant to accepting that. Mm -hmm. I think he's right. There's right, but mm -hmm. go ahead. Sorry, yeah. That's a, yeah. Go ahead. I mean, here perhaps we should be a bit um, ourselves, or ec ecstatic naturalists, or creolecticians, or mm -hmm. uh and say, well, death is a perspective, right? Uh, mm -hmm. death of something is the reverse of something else so in fact mm -hmm. death doesn't exist per se uh, if we have an, an ontology of becoming uh, so so the problem in calling it death drive is that we we might fall into whitehead I know your reader will have whitehead to call simply mm -hmm. the, a fallacy of misplaced concreteness right so I mean, that again may sound like I'm justifying cruelty, but I'm, I'm trying to be a, a, oh, yeah. any moral here and saying yeah. that there will be always a perspective from which anything that you do is cruel. There could also be a perspective from which every, anything that you do is just a, the ecstasy of becoming. Mm -hmm. Right, and I wanted to come go back to the term ecstasy, which is in in the very center of uh, your let's call it quasi system, which is a complement uh, following what we just said. Right, so and and we completely agree on this. I think, but without knowing each other, we were writing the same things. I mm -hmm. think that yes. the real, the real, is the ecstasy of the creel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, by taking the uh, etymology of ecstasy is exteriorization, right? Yeah. So, who are we to? I mean, you said yourself, uh, good and 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 evil come after. Mm -hmm. So, who are we to decide what is um, ontologically bad? Or that's a very difficult question. And I know that Plato thinks that the the good is is what we all um pursuing but is it is is the is the 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 creel source is ecstatic nature pursuing the good or is it just exploding in all directions and containing in itself the negation of that explosion which creates uh, this constant um you know, branching, which is a, an attempt, we see it as branching, but it's an attempt towards unification that never really happens. Yeah. But unification and multi um, and, and expansion or, or difference, they are amoral, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you take that ontology. Yeah. So we, having said that, if since we are living in worlds, we want to create some sort of order, therefore we want to create some sort of morality perhaps yeah how do we how do we combine both how do we combine a amoral ontology with a moral politics yeah i agree with purse that aesthetics grounds ethics and ethics grounds logic very interesting triad he developed the aesthetic is after the sumum bonum or the ultimate good but there is no ultimate good on this earth for sure and maybe even after if we do survive bodily death and so on it's an aesthetic project to balance what we're inclined to call good versus evil for often good reasons and it's a shaping toward a whole that remains fragmentary and embedded in the many and one of the best accounts of the one and the many is in William James's pluralistic universe, where there are many many's and many ones, and you don't have to choose, mm. both operating ontologically. And I, I, I admire his, his way of coming through psychology into philosophy, uh, from the principles of psychology to his later writings. 
and but wait, that's that's gonna be hard for a philosopher to accept, right? That there are many ones, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. many multiples. Okay, uh, à la rigueur, as the French say, uh, yeah. we could perhaps let it pass. But um, many ones that yeah. very <laughs> anti philosophical. Mm. Well, I, ones are also subject to entropy and change. And if you don't grasp the ubiquity of entropy, you don't see what's surrounding us and within us. Entropy is overcome by theft. So any food I eat is stolen from a life form, whether it's vegetable or meat, whatever your choices are there. And I can't get through the day without stealing energy from living systems. Mm -hmm. They die, so I don't. But I will, and then the worms will get me. So mm -hmm. pay back. <laughs> right. So it's, it's a nature is really a brutal business. Or is it, it's enjoying itself. Um, Lacan said that if God exists, then he is jouissance, as you, as you know, right? So jouissance being that French term, um, I'm saying that for the, for the listeners, so, so some mm -hmm. might not know, uh, that a, it's sort of a extreme enjoyment. Uh, it, it is used uh, in sexuality. Yes. 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 As an orgasm. Yes. But so if we see nature as as and that ecstasy as a, is a process, we might um, assume that this is a form of jouissance, and that's that's again that's um, not uh, considering necessarily how does it feel for the localities, right? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. You, I. Uh, so wouldn't a form of um, divine attainment of knowledge be one that fuses with the fact that this ecstasy is enjoyment and if and if I'm about to die in the next minute, mm -hmm. um, that's still part of the enjoyment. Yeah. I agree thoroughly with that. It's a good corrective to an overemphasis on uh, entropy. Because mm. jouissance is in nature, not just the human psyche. When you blast through the name of the father and get into uh, proper use of the symbolic and so on. Yeah. There is joy everywhere as well. I've been to India three times and I've seen horrors and I've seen an expression of jouissance that's almost unmatched in the world. Mm. And uh, it's there. And I think we, we seek it and we get it. Mm. Yeah, you're right. Hmm. And of course, that leaves a silence because we would like it to be distributed locally such that there are no local perspectives that say, I am suffering, I am lonely, I've been betrayed, yeah. um, etc., which is a, a factum of, of human experience, whether it's uh, an illusion or not. Mm -hmm. is it is something i mean even if it's an illusion it, it's it's a problem even a philosophical problem right the famous problem of evil for mm -hmm. uh, for theology which leads me to i also said uh that i was uh, leaving the world the the word uh theosis in uh, suspense and i want to come back to that Mm -hmm. um, because uh, I mean, when you speak of Jasper's, and I agree with you, that is even philosophically, I think he is underestimated um, yeah. compared yeah. to uh, to Heidegger. Mm -hmm. um, and but I think things are changing. Some people are starting to, to reconsider him, even 
in uh, in fields that are unexpectable, unexpected, like AI uh, mm. uh, and uh, where the cipher uh, can be compared to what is happening in the black box of machine learning and etc. But mm. going back to the idea of theosis, okay, so. We know, and again, this is for the listener, that there is a uh, orthodox tradition in Christology that takes seriously the fact that we, in this life, we can uh, become godlike. Theosis. Right, theosis. Mm -hmm. And and so this is a sort of a, a through a spiritual process of purification Mm -hmm. uh, both uh, behavioral and um, and epistemological, but I was wondering here if that theosis is not a um, a sort of um, answer to the problem of evil, and I'll give a very simple example to illustrate that, which is Gandhi's nonviolence. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Gandhi's nonviolence is a very interesting moment in history where uh, mm -hmm. you see you see what I mean, right? Where where the the, the problem of evil is, is is countered by an embodied epistemology of theosis, which is you know I I disregard the illusion of suffering by submitting myself to it in a way that is without resistance. Mm. I do it, I don't do it um, by adhering to some sort of, to some sort of nihilism that would say, uh, you know, everything, whatever happens, it's, it's enjoyment. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it in a way that recognizes that the multiple and difference need the one and therefore that there might be a horizon even if we never reach it where you some sort of unification mm -hmm. is desirable and therefore on the political uh sphere and domain it is not ontolog ontologically uh false to claim well uh Un union is possible, whether it's union of India, union of today uh, of the Earth, right, uh, around a shared cosmology. Mm -hmm. So I do think in the ontology that we are proposing, if we accept that there is not only uh, multiplicity and difference in this um, natura naturans, but just by the fact to speak your language, if we say natura, we are supposing a unity. We're not saying that yes. there are three natures. Right, so right, it right. is there, therefore the politics are there. There is actually a book uh, uh, called The Politics of the One uh, with several texts where mm. the question of the one and the many is taken seriously for uh, contemporary politics. And I'll finish on that point to give a very uh, schematic and, and simplified a, um, uh, explanation of, of the last 3,000 years ontologically speaking is that we have been under, reg under the regime of the one let's say until the french and american revolution mm -hmm. with the king the the church monotheism mm -hmm. uh, at least in the western world um and then we sort of shifted dialectically uh to uh or creolectically to its opposite to um a, uh, a discourse of, of the many, right? The democratic discourse of pluralism, mm -hmm. uh, which I think has attained, and, and now we're going to be able to talk about uh, the US, right? Or the US that we all became in a way, yeah. maybe Russia and China, that we'll talk about that too, maybe. But so mm -hmm. I think this, this moment of um, multiplicity has reached is moment of contradiction is that I don't believe in uh, like Chantal Mouffe in agonistic pluralism. I don't believe that you can have all these communities and just uh, let them fight for for their own uh, 
uh, little totem or absolute in, in any way, some sort of um, order will emerge of their uh, fight, which is, by the way, it presents itself as a leftist discourse, but is actually a reactivation of Adam Smith's invisible hand mm. applied to, to communities. So mm. when we, we read a bit of Lacan, even psychoanalysis, we know that there's no such thing as the good community and the bad community, all communities are imperialist. Uh, so knowing that we're going to stop, uh, you know, giving candies to the good communities and, and blaming the bad communities for being fascist, they are all fascist. And mm. the problem is that uh, they, if there is only the attempt or the belief that we will let the micro esprit de corps uh, intershock each other, and that's going to create some sort of pluralistic order without a shared cosmology. I think this is totally wrong, and this is what is happening now. Thankfully, the Earth is calling us to wake up and saying, no, we need to return to some form of oneness mm -hmm. by negating the plural moment. Okay, so it's oneness in otherness, oneness in, in diversity, oneness in multiplicity. Mm -hmm. But I think we, oneness needs to come back in the equation. Uh, and what I would suggest here is that, and there is actually... Um, a proposal on on that uh you know very often you probably know that we we come up with an idea then we do a little bit of search and realize that someone already had it and and that's fine um i was playing with the term ecotheosis uh ecotheosis the other day mm. Lies. so so a theosis that would be not just individualistic right the mm. i become uh, godlike and and i despise all the uh <laughs> the ape humans uh no it's it's like a collective uh theosis including non-humans so uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. i realized that roland faber uh from um claremont university i don't know if he moved but he has this uh, chapter called eco theology eco process and eco theosis mm -hmm. seems to to go in the same direction so i'll stop here a very long winded um uh, digression but you can pick any element that you wish to bounce and and um and perhaps let me know if this answers in 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 a way that seems satisfactory to your concern you seem to be concerned about suffering and violence and mm -hmm. i find your perspective very congenial to me i think i'm i'm a little nervous about any teleology after darwin but humans have teloi they have goals and i think seeking the one through a common cosmology can be a powerful creative healing urge in our species so i would be very happy with that as a theory and hopefully a fact because uh, communities i talk about com natural communities and communities of interpreters and natural communities are fascist they operate through the fewer principle their signs and symbols are locked in there's all kinds of censorship and control mechanism within that ubiquitous net those natural communities that we all inhabit there is a moment where as josiah royce talks about it community of interpreters can emerge and he talked about in terms of spirit, the spirit interpreter, I'm bouncing off St. Paul a bit, but uh, the spirit pulls you toward a much more pluralistic use of science and symbols and power structures and has a lot of critique in Foucault's sense built in to undermine, at least on a micro level, some of these demonic structures of power. So, but the quest for the one if it's not filled with very specific tribal content, my one, my tribe, if it's not 
wallowing in that or trapped in that, then the emergence of a real engaged dialectic with other horizons of meaning and shapes of self-consciousness can happen. It's a fitful process. It's not nirvana, we're done. That's not ever going to happen. Because of inertia and laziness and all kinds of things. So the one is there. It's, there's no one one, I would say, unless it's in Plotinus's sense. Mm. But there's no cultural one that's worldwide. Mm. Never happened. Do you want to explain to the listener a bit more about the um, about Plotinus's one? The one in Plotinus has no traits. It doesn't create, it doesn't cause, it's not filled with a personhood or an emotional structure or intervening in history. It's the place of overflow. And the question is, does the one plan to produce a world soul or actually noose first, mind, or is it just an emergence and if so, why mind the way it's structured, universal mind? And then why does world soul come out and then my soul come out and then matter at the bottom of the list, <laughs> which Proclus corrected, come out. Um, so the one isn't doing anything, just there overflowing. Hmm. So it's if you place. assign it straight to it, you, you, you don't get Plotinus. Hmm. Mm. So that is is what's the relationship between that one and the one uh, I'm I'm making it it's a sort of a very um mm. artificial connection here just to get you to talk about the US but you know, we know that the motto of the US is uh, out of many one mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that oneness of uh, the US where is it now? It's 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 a would be, a could be, a wanna be. <laughs> it's not a fact. <laughs> and in fact, the whole system is geared toward turning people against each other. Mm -hmm. And it's it's uh, almost like a ra a rabid infection mm -hmm. in our culture. We, okay. we have to hate somebody to get through the day. Right. Right. Yeah. I'd like to suggest something that the American one is the virtual in 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 the sense of the the metaverse, right? In the sense mm -hmm. of digital virtual, is that yeah they and and that's probably because of their deeply ingrained uh, Catholicism or, or 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 Christianism, right? The idea that paradise is not. Mm -hmm. on earth i mean we had a moment where we thought americans were saying oh we're actually paradise you know is on earth it's us we're creating but mm -hmm. very quickly and very slowly uh at least at least it seems to me that they're more interested in artifacts and virtual images of paradise mm -hmm. obviously mm -hmm. hollywood and yeah. now uh all the um the digital world while I would argue that um, China and Russia are still very interested in embodied reality. Mm -hmm. And so, and we might criticize and then say, and yes, I mean, uh, of course, uh, it's, it's fascist. It's in the sense that it, it doesn't allow for uh much i mean it, it doesn't always allow for freedom of thought although i don't want to enter into cliches about china because uh but um but still i mean we can criticize their passion for order but we can also um we can also acknowledge that they are still attached to the real to reality Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not the real in in the lacanism but to simply reality yeah uh, and the world as and paradise on earth 
with mm -hmm. all the problems that it might suggest. While America seems to have, uh, I wrote a novel called Paradiso, which is sort of a, a duplication on the earth, a virtual duplication on the earth. So when you do that, it's like you totally give up on, 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 on reality. And, and then you have this chaos yeah, uh, which is falsely ordered um, in in a, in the clone reality of the virtual. Mm -hmm. That'd be one explanation. Yeah, the one of the perennial human curses is apocalypticism, which some religions use as a weapon to control. But apocalypticism is all over the place, and certainly in America, partly because of millennial Protestantism and other forces. Uh, and apocalypticism is driving our economy. There's a panic purchasing, say, of gold and silver right mm -hmm. now. We're right. running out of silver in the coin shops because of an apocalyptic, apocalyptic sense that fiat currency is going to fail. Right. And it's the BRICS currency from the East, Brazil, India, China, Russia, South Africa, and maybe Saudi Arabia that will compete with the dollar. So there we have a lot of uh, what do they call preppers that on YouTube about how to protect yourself for when the world collapses. Right. And it's it's shaping and distorting people's lives. Right. But it seems to be an addiction. Hmm. It's a real addiction. Right. And embedded in the very form of capitalism that america is producing right now if you take elon musk is at the same time yeah leader yeah. in ai and uh claiming that ai is going to be the end of humanity this can be done in the same uh gesture by the same person so is, is that apocalyptic capitalism or mm -hmm. yeah and the ai scare is growing uh, even among scientists and some politicians, but it would—I think it'd be more like um, challenges to specific regions of human activity. Uh, I can't imagine AI could replace a good therapist, for example. Mm. Although they're, they're working on that, <laughs> right? And science fiction, going back to uh, Asimov's I Robot, has been wrestling with what's going to happen when they attain self-consciousness and autonomy and make decisions that aren't programmed by us. So if you want to understand the future, science fiction is often called speculative history. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of work, very high level work being done in that genre, that oeuvre, <laughs> to um, wrestle with so many of the implications of AI in our lives. Jobs will be lost. Um, mistakes have come out of AI recently. And uh, people have written about that. It's been on YouTube. So that's another apocalyptic word. And I think it's going to be more piecemeal challenges mm -hmm. rather than an iRobot rebellion to conquer our species and get rid of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's an extreme apocalyptic scenario. Uh, but it's a mystery what's going on inside of one of these things. Right. And so how do you articulate with it? Because it's, you say there's nothing outside of nature. So AI is nature. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Everything is. My thought is nature. Rock of Gibraltar is nature. Tinkerbell is nature. <laughs> and they're all real. Right. They're differently real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're different... Um, uh, what do you call it? Levels, states of the real, and how does that relate to um, to states of consciousness? Mm. Levels of consciousness, levels of the real. Is that what you're looking into? That was a question, and because you you did say that there there were different. Everything is in nature, but it differently. Um... Yeah, yeah, it prevails differently. So you could say um, a Shakespearean character is real, 
but not as a physical space time unit, except as embodied by a physical space time unit. Is Shakespeare more real than his plays? Are his plays more real than his rotting body? Real can be a weapon word. My world is more real than yours. Mm -hmm. And I would say I, I very much appreciate the principle called ontological parody. Whatever is and whatever way it is, is real, as opposed to ontological priority, which was very strong in the Middle Ages in philosophy, that you have degrees of uh, moving from potentiality to actuality to octus purus and Aquinas, pure actuality and with some Aristotle in there. <laughs> mm. um, but there aren't degrees, they're just modes or dimensions. So my desire to eat some ice cream is no less real than World War II, but it's very differently real hmm. in terms of effects. And that stuff. sounds like a good title. I might use that for yeah. our interview. <laughs> Uh, I, I suggest that we perhaps pause here, not, not that we don't, don't have much more to say, but I think maybe we'll, we might do several episodes. Mm -hmm. um, I will, though, end with one question. If this were, and, and I mean, you're still young, and, and uh, I'm sure we can have this conversation for another decade or two, but if this were your last question, the last question of your last interview, what would you like me to ask you? Is the relationship between nature, naturing, and nature, natured, symmetrical or asymmetrical? That's yeah. a puzzle, yeah. So nature, naturing affects nature nature does what happens in nature nature that is the orders of the world affect nature nature i don't have an answer mm. but i think about it a lot mm. that's a great um you know, that's a great speculative last point to to end on you know lacan loved to end his sessions on this moments of puzzlement because they mm. they facilitate uh, the digestion of what was said. I think it's a great question. I'm going to think about it without brushing into an answer now. Mm -hmm. uh, so, well, thank you very much. Thank and um, we will stop the uh, recording here. Okay, great. Thank you so much.